So, welcome to this class on uh, neuroscience of human movement. Uh, this is part 4 of uh, the class on primary motor cortex. So, in today's class we will be talking about uh, how populations of neurons contribute to activity or movements. Right. Uh, in particular, the work of uh, Jajopoulos. where he showed that uh, movement direction was encoded in a group or in a population of neurons. We will discuss the details of this work and how effects of level and direction of for force that is exerted are uh, represented or, or at least coded by neurons in the primary motor cortex. Okay. This is the work of uh, suppose, uh, Ebfets, I think. Okay. So, in the 1980s, Apostolos Georgopoulos and his colleagues did an experiment. Uh, such experiments are still being uh, performed, very popular paradigm. So, let me try and explain the paradigm first. This paradigm is called as the center out reaching task. So, what is this? Uh, let me explain. So, there is a central home position. So, I am going to draw the central home position with the letter H here and uh, there were different targets. Okay. These different targets are it could be to the east okay, or it could be to the north, it could be to the west, it could be to the south, it could be of course, to the northeast, to the northwest, to the southwest and to the southeast. So, effectively there were 8 directions okay. and monkeys are trained to reach to these two 8 directions. Okay. Such experiments are uh, still being performed in monkeys and in humans currently. This kind of uh, reaching task where you start from a central position and go out in a direction are called as center out reaching tasks. Very popular uh, paradigm, hundreds of papers you could read uh, that use these tasks to study how movements are controlled. Right. So, he they used a center out reaching task to wherein different directions monkeys reach to different directions and they recorded from a whole set of neurons a whole bunch of neurons right not just a single neuron a whole set of neurons. And what they found was that when you take combined activity of a population of neurons then you could predict the movement direction. Okay. So, let me try and explain. On the left here, here on the left you see activity of a single neuron. Right. So, this neuron is very active in uh, that direction which is uh, the 135 degree direction and the 180 degree direction you see that there is. So, these are raster plots. So, the the more the activity more uh, number of uh, lines will be here and the darker will will be the shades. So, for example, this and this right. So, so this neuron is very active in these two directions and slightly less active in the 90 degree direction, so or the 225 degree direction, right. So, in these two directions it is less active and as you move in other directions its activity continues to reduce in directions exactly opposite to the most active directions which are that one and that one. At, uh, in directions exactly opposite to these which are what are these two directions that is the direction that is opposite to this one 
and that is the direction that is opposite to that one. Let us let us name this for the sake of convenience. So, I am going to call this direction as the 180 degree direction, this as 315 degree direction, okay. Does not matter. So, if you see 135 degree direction, this neuron is very active, and 180 degree direction it is very active, whereas in the 0 degree direction and in the 315 degree direction it is uh, very silent. This is for a single neuron. What this shows is that movement direction or specific neurons are active depending on the particular direction in which the movement is happening. Specific neurons have some preferred directions in which they are most active and in other directions they are less and less active and in directions exactly opposite to their preferred directions they are very silent. right? As you can see there is a lot of white space here and here is it not. From this we could deduce that you know uh, that these are the least preferred directions for this uh, for this particular neuron. From this data we could come up with a directional tuning curve for this neuron. So, this tuning curve will look something like this. So, you know something like this with its uh, highest magnitude for example, uh, for example, at 135 degree direction. At 135 degrees, this is going to have the maximum amplitude, and at uh, you know at two other directions, that could be you know 180 degrees. This is 180 degrees, and uh, you know 90 degrees. The amplitude is slightly less. At other directions, the amplitude is going to be much lower. This is for a single uh, neuron. But note there may be other neurons whose directional tuning curves. So, this is called as the directional tuning curve for this particular neuron. Okay. What Georgopoulos did was that he found directional tuning curves, similar directional tuning curves for a whole bunch of other neurons, and he found that different neurons had different preferred directions. So, Effectively, what I can do is that each neuron's activity in a particular direction, if I represent using a vector, then I add the activity of all the cells together, or I vector sum over uh, uh, each direction. Then what I will get is that the entire population of uh, neurons will predict the overall uh, direction made by the uh, the primate or in other words so what happens is that if i do this for a whole bunch of neurons there may be other neuron for which for example a similar uh, directional tuning curve will be there for that the maximum uh, amplitude will be at 90 degrees there will be another neuron for which a similar directional tuning curve will be there for which the uh, maximum amplitude will be at 0 degrees right and there will be another neuron for uh, for which one more uh, directional tuning curve will be there for which the maximum amplitude will be at, uh, you know 315 degrees like that. Now, note when I when the monkey is moving in a particular direction I know the direction in which the monkey has moved and now if I add the activity or vector sum the activity of all these uh, neurons then I am going to get a uh, response like this. So, each line here represents the activity of uh, uh, represents the direction of uh, the activity of a neuron and when I vector sum all this I am going to get a direction like that for example, this is the vector sum of all these lines. Similarly, the line in the center that line is the vector sum of all these other lines this line is the vector sum of all these other lines and so on and so forth. From these neurons we are able to predict from these activities or from this approach I am able to predict what the direction of movement is from the activity of neurons. So, from this we could deduce that a population of neurons encode uh, direction of movement. Note importantly that uh, movement direction in this case right is not specifically controlled by a single muscle. Now, depending on the 
we will have to go back to our earlier classes and remind ourselves of how this is done. This is a center out reaching task depending on the direction of movement. So, that means, I if this is the center suppose uh, the, the place where I am holding or the uh, place where I am holding this remote is the center let us assume that. Then if I am doing that right that is one moment and if I am doing doing that that is another moment if I am doing this that is another moment that is another moment. Note fundamentally there is a huge difference in the way these movements are executed right because the muscles responsible for that movement is different from the muscle that is responsible for the opposite movement is it not because uh, these two one is a uh, flexion movement the other is an extension movement. So, flexors are involved in one case extensors are involved in other case. So, uh, individual muscle activity is not considered here, but rather the movement direction itself is considered. So, that means coordinated muscle activity output movement is the output of coordinated muscle activity. So, coordinated muscle activity is predicted by a population of neurons. This approach to using vectors to study populations of new neurons has become popular very popular in neuroscience because this is called as the population vector approach ok. This is uh, this was uh, championed first pioneered by Apostolos Georgopoulos and his colleagues. So, this is seminal papers of 1982 and 1983 right showing how depending on the movement direction the activity of different sets of uh, neurons varied ok. And note importantly that uh, one is that movement is what is encoded not individual muscle activity. Note also how this varies in contrast with what we saw in yesterday's class in the previous class. In the previous class what we saw was that A. D. Watts showed that activity of specific muscles are encoded by individual neurons. The fundamental difference between that approach and this approach is that in this case multiple neurons are recorded and their population activity is what is being used to predict uh, the movements. Whereas, in the previous case in uh, Edwards case only a few neurons or only a single neuronal activity is used to predict active correlations with muscle activity and correlations with kinematics and kinetics of movement ok fundamental difference in the approach ok. Here so, what we have learned from this slide is that you know uh, we can use activity of a population of neurons to predict movement direction ok. What was also shown uh, by Ebfetz and his colleagues. So, this is uh, work of Ebfetz in the 1970s and uh, 1980s late 1970s and early 1980s are is that uh, the level and direction of force exerted coded by the neurons in the primary motor cortex. Especially the following is true ok. So, here different lines that I am going to draw represent uh, activity of different neurons ok. So, this is torque I suppose uh, this is uh, firing frequency of different neurons each line that I am going to draw represents the activity of uh, one neuron. So, if you take up uh, if you take one particular neuron as the torque that needs to be produced increases the firing frequency increases. By the way what is this task? So, in the previous case we saw this is a center out reaching task in the previous case in the case of Georgopoulos that is a center out reaching task. So, there is a center here you have to reach to different directions right this is a center out reaching task. But what did Epfetz do in in this case? The the task is a static force production or isometric force production. What does this mean? This means there is no real movement there is an object here and I am trying to hold that object and produce force on that object in multiple directions and at multiple levels right. I, I and this object is not going to move it is a strong object that is completely fixed to the uh, to a table or something like that. So, I am I am trying to work very hard 
right? I am trying to push it in a particular direction. I could increase it to a level, I could decrease it, I could push it in the opposite direction, I could do a whole bunch of things, but is, this is not going to move. So, this is isometric force production that is that involves no real movements. So, in this case the torque that is produced or the muzzle torque that is pr produced is uh, varying linearly with firing frequency or as the torque increases the activity of this particular neuron or uh, the firing frequency in this particular neuron increases. So, let us take a different neuron in the case of a different neuron uh, the torque increases like this in a different neuron it increases like that in a different neuron it increases like that in a different neuron it increases like that not not like that uh, like that in a different neuron it increases like that and so on and so forth. These are activities of say 6 5 6 neurons right like this we could record uh, activity of multiple neurons. So, multiple neurons obviously the slopes of all these uh, lines will be different, but what is important to note is this message that in general this is true if I take the average of all these things approximately this is the line that I am going to get. What is the message from this? The message is that if I have to increase the force then the firing frequency will increase importantly what this means is in the case of isometric force production this is true in the case of isometric force production. So, this provides crucial very strong evidence in support of the hypothesis that in the absence of movements when there is no movement there is no such thing as kinematics this is isometric force production. In the absence of movements force level is encoded by the primary motor cortex. So, uh, the idea that force is being control is the, is a control variable some evidence at least in the range of uh, forces considered and the firing frequencies considered in the range of forces considered and in the set of neurons taken at least you could say that uh, there is a very nice correlation between uh, force level and the activity of the primary motor cortex neuron. So, in in summary what we have seen in this class is the work seminal work of Apostolus Georgopoulos in showing that uh, the direction of movement is encoded by a population of uh, neurons. So, using the uh, using the famous population vector technique okay. and the work of Epfels where he showed that the level of force is encoded by the activity of uh, primary motor cortex neurons. Okay. So, we will stop here and uh, we will continue this discussions in future classes. So, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.